Hey folks, what's up? I'm back with another game review from our Patreon page. Here we once again have uh, Mitch Fabian submitting a game. And this game I thought uh, is going to be really interesting, both for people who play the London and people who play against the London, which nowadays is pretty much everybody. Um, in this game, Mitch goes up against the, the London, which is a uh, typical weapon of his opponent here, uh, Rio Bikajet, aka Joel. And uh, he gets into some really interesting strategic difficulties that I imagine are happening in all kinds of games. And it'll give us uh, a good chance to talk about the London structure and what are some of the typical ideas uh, that Black should utilize. Um, so the move order here is kind of like a Nimzo move order, which I think is totally fine. And what I've seen a lot of players do in this kind of position uh, is keep their pawn on d7 and actually just develop the bishop uh, via b6 to bishop b7 and eventually putting this pawn on d6. I think that this is a quite a flexible approach. It's one that can be maybe considered anti-London because we're not giving white this uh, key e5 square that they normally love uh, to control and play around. Uh, this is definitely a setup that I think could be really interesting to investigate. Uh, but objectively, there's nothing wrong with what Black does in the game, which is uh, playing d5 and kind of transposing back into these typical London variations. Uh, so bishop d6, bishop g3, castles, bishop d3. Here Black plays b6, which very normal move. Uh, and now White goes for this move, knight to e5. Now, I'm really not a London expert. I've honestly barely looked at the official theory. Uh, I know that this is uh, definitely a popular move. And just a popular idea in general to try and support this knight with f4, um, creating this kind of like Pillsbury attack type setup. But it's definitely not fatal for black, and black does have ways of fighting against white setup. Uh, so bishop b7, f4, and here black plays knight to e7, which I think is a totally reasonable move. The idea is to eventually transfer this knight to the f5 square and kind of blunt white's pressure on this diagonal. Here white plays queen to b1. It's kind of a cheeky move, but it makes a lot of sense. The point is that if black ever plays c4 and uh, chases down the bishop, white can keep the bishop on the diagonal with queen uh, bishop c2. As opposed to queen c2, black can maybe just immediately go c4 here, and the bishop is forced to a bad square on e2, and I think black would already be totally fine. So queen to b1, and uh, here Mitch is already on his own, and after some thought decides to take on d4. I think objectively this move is totally fine, but there are different ways of playing the position. One is uh, the way that Mitch kind of plays it. Um, the other way would be to start with this move g6, which uh, Stockfish is actually quite fond of. And the idea of, let's say, just blunting this diagonal uh, to take over the control over the f5 square, I think this is a pretty good one. Uh, and the way that the engine wants to follow up in this position I would say is a little bit counterintuitive at first. Let's say white goes bishop f2. This is kind of a thematic move to open up uh, the road for the g and h pawns to kind of start pushing forward. What Stockfish wants to do in this position is to push c4 and then b5. And generally this is considered a strategic no-no because it feels like black has given up all of their pressure against the center. They've now closed the center and allowed white uh, quote-unquote freehand on the king side. But I actually don't think it's that clear, and I think Black's counterplay is very obvious. Black just wants to play b4, uh, take on c3, eventually leave white with the weakness, maybe putting a rook on b8, maybe going queen a5. And yeah, objectively, I feel like Black's chances here are actually quite reasonable, and white doesn't have anything uh, too special on the king side. At least Black's counterplay, I believe, is just as fast. Um, but what Mitch does is uh, very human as well. Uh, takes on d4, e takes d4 and uh, plays g6. Here white continues bishop f2, kind of following the same plan. And this is where Mitch starts uh, to go kind of wrong here with the move knight to e8. Uh, I believe this position is still following theory, and let's say the classic plan in this kind of position I always believed uh, to be connected with the move knight f5. And the point here is to maneuver this bishop back to e7, drop this knight back to d6, and then bring this uh, f knight to the e4 square. So nice little maneuver where we get the f knight to e4, and then black has total control over the e4 square and eventually uh, can play f6. Of course, the tactics have to work out. You have to make sure that you have enough defenders on e4, but 
yeah, with two knights, bishop, and pawn, black can basically get the job done. And again, eventually this point is to get uh, the move f6 in, which challenges white's knight on e5. Uh, so I think this is a very uh, typical plan. I'll just show a couple moves here. And there was a game where white played bishop h4, knight fe4, and black was basically already okay uh, trading the dark square bishops and just keeping a strong knight on e4. And uh, the other way black seems to be playing this type of position is with the somewhat strange move knight h5. But again, this move is connected with playing f6 and taking away this outpost from white. Also, black hits the f4 pawn, so white generally goes g3 here. Uh, and then, for example, f6, knight comes back to f3, and this key move, queen to c8, this move is a pretty thematic one for this kind of structure. And the idea is not just to uh, defend the e6 pawn in advance, but actually just to trade off the light square bishops, which is definitely uh, a big strategic goal that black would like to achieve. And the knight on h5 can drop back to g7 at some point, again, covering the e6 pawn, which can definitely be a, a serious weakness, um, but also preparing to one day take over the f5 square. So I also think black is totally fine uh, in this position as well. Now the move that uh, Mitch chooses here, knight to e8, is pretty similar in that this allows black to play f6. Uh, but the drawback is that the knight is actually not on h5, which number one gains a tempo against the f4 pawn, but also stops white from playing one of their main plans in the position, h4, h5. So what Joel should have done here is play the immediate move h4, just looking to advance h5 and looking to uh, create some possible sacrifices on the g6 square. And if black plays h5 themselves, then White has to kind of switch plans and play for the g4 break. And something like queen d1, I think, is already very interesting. Maybe even the immediate g4. And yeah, white is just well on their way to opening up black's kingside. Uh, instead, white plays g3, which is a typical move, but a little bit slow. Uh, gives black time to play knight g7 and start kind of shoring up his kingside position. Now white does continue h4. And this is where Mitch really starts to go wrong. He plays this move h5, which feels very thematic, but really the key question uh, is just why not f6? You know, this is white's kind of best square in the position. Their knight on e5 is arguably their best piece. And here black is perfectly suited to play f6, take away the square from white's pieces, force the knight back. Uh, this knight on g7 is nicely covering the e6 pawn. And yeah, I actually think white has very, very little here. Uh, of course, white can try to castle and put pressure on the e-file, but white has already weakened the king side quite a bit with g3, h4. So for white to now switch plans and go castles and rook fe1, I mean, they're really not going to get very much done, and they've kind of weakened their position long term. Uh, in the meantime, after, let's say, something knight, like knight e f3, black can play a5 here and play for this plan of bishop a6, which is pretty annoying because either white has to trade off, again, one of their best minor pieces, the light square bishop, or the bishop has to see the diagonal, and then black's light square bishop on this diagonal is going to be uh, a really annoying piece. And then somewhere black will just break with e5, and white's king is going to get stuck uh, and caught on e1. Uh, so it was definitely not too late for black to get, I think, a very nice position. And this key move f6, I think, uh, is definitely one to remember. Uh, instead, after h5, white goes queen to c2. Uh, here, I think... Black can still keep fighting with a move like a5, bishop a6, again, just trying to trade off the light squared bishops. Uh, but now Mitch really kind of loses his mind here and plays this move f5. And in his notes, he kind of justifies it as hoping to, let's say, shut down white's attack uh, on the king side. And while that might be true, now white is going to have a really hard time getting any kind of g4 break in. Uh, of course, the drawbacks of this move are, are quite clear. Now white has this beautiful outpost on the e5 square. Uh, white also gets an outpost on the g5 square, and strategically, white's position is just absolutely crushing. So black kind of avoids getting himself, you know, mated on the king side, but uh, at what cost, right? Black is now just strategically lost um, for uh, quite some time here, and yeah, Mitch gets himself into just a completely uh, terrible position. Now, uh, black did end up winning this game, which is, I think, uh, quite surprising, but of course this has nothing to do with the opening at this point. White is just totally dominating, and uh, I like how White uh, continues to to play here. He goes bishop to b5, uh, keeping his control over the e5 square. Black eventually takes with the dark square bishop because just can't tolerate this knight for very long, and uh, White very understandably recaptures uh, with the piece. I think fe would have been stronger here, kind of opening up some dark squares uh, for the bishop to use.
in both cases white just has a uh, decisive advantage and uh, yeah black basically just tries to hold on for as long as he can um, but things do kind of get worse and worse here as uh, white finds this nice move c4 to start breaking open the position and uh, one day trying to get to uh, black's king so game continues d takes c4 white pushes d5 uh, now there's a lot of complications here but basically white is on top all over the place just all of the strategic advantages are in white's favor here and uh, white keeps the advantage for quite some time um here bishop d4 is played as we can see white is sacrificed the pawn but has lots of tactics on this diagonal and if the rook moves away the knight takes e6 is just going to be crushing so mitch has to give back the pawn somewhat in desperation but yeah this move is basically just forced uh, and now white could have taken with the queen or with the bishop personally i think the bishop would have been the most natural just to keep the diagonal open and again white would just have a strategically decisive uh, position here instead white plays fe and still keeps a uh, decisive advantage uh, though eventually i think this game uh, goes into some mutual time trouble and black ends up winning after some insane uh, complications uh, I'll leave the game uh, linked for those of you that want to check out the whole thing. But yeah, at this point, there's, uh, let's say, lots of mutual mistakes from both sides after this point. I think not the most interesting thing uh, for our lecture here. The main thing I wanted to highlight from this video is just how to play against this uh, key knight on e5 that London players uh, love to use. And yeah, we got to prepare uh, f6 in this kind of position and also utilize this plan of pushing a5 and bishop a6 or queen c8 and bishop a6 to either activate our light square bishop or just trade it off for uh, white's light square bishop. So this was the position where black had a couple of plans, knight f5, bishop e7, knight d6 being one of them, uh, knight h5 followed by f6 being another plan that I think is uh, really interesting as well. Um, and lastly, this plan of just shutting everything down by playing g6, c4, and b5. A lot of times this can backfire for black uh, if you close down the center too quickly. But here I think black's counterplay is very, very clear with b4, rook b8, and queen a5 coming. So all right, guys, that's going to wrap it up for this video. I hope you found it instructive. If you did, please let us know in the comment section below. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, make sure to do so. We would really appreciate it. Uh, all right, hopefully I'll see you in the next one. Take care.